Does public education respect the fact that fathers are valuable leaders? We are going to talk about it tonight on The Eight Black Hands. Stay tuned. Welcome, fam, to episode 191 of the Father Father Powered Eight Black Hands. It's your Sunday night professional development and your education church all wrapped up in one. It's Ray, Sharif, and Chris. And of course, all of you joining us on a Sunday night to talk about how we're going to get our 8 million black kids in education. We have a very special guest tonight. Not going to get to that part yet. We're not going to get to the the guest part yet. We're going to start first with the check-in with the brothers. I was I missed last week, uh, and I had some things going on, and I have some things going on in life. So um, so I had to miss it, so I wasn't here. But uh, it's good for me to be back and to check in with you, brothers. So first, brothers, what's up? How you do, How y'all doing? Good, man. It's good, good, to, good to be back. Good, um, good to see y'all. Yo, Philly Stomp, New York today. I mean, that's always a beautiful thing. You know what I mean? Like that's uh, <laughs> man. You know, we. So it's a beautiful night to be a, a a sports fan in Philly, and um, you know, and I think this uh this topic, you know, for me is really uh, you know, just really important. Um, and uh, at least I've experienced it in a very different way than I think um a lot of places have. So, you know, excited to dive into that as well. Son, father, uncle, brother, uh, Ray, <laughs> young boy. You should have. You should have added yeah, young in. Like, hey, for people listening, uh, Ray has a different name every week on his on his. Hey. This is his name this week that he has listed, and you <laughs> oh. can't see it as a listener, but this is what he's calling himself. So it's important to name all of these things, right? And the reason why it's important to name these things is because when you think about black fatherhood, it's all encompassing. Right. And so it's like you don't have to be someone's biological father in order to uh, present as someone that is meaningful in someone's life. Right. And so I'm, I'm, I'm waiting and, and, uh, and super interested in unpacking how folks uh, show up in the lives of youth uh, without even having a title of being father. But then also, you know, you got some stepdads out here. You got you got folks that fall under this umbrella that we never really talk about and we never really give the flowers to. And so tonight is going to be dope because we're giving flowers to the dads that are may not be in the household, but are definitely in the lives of their children. Yeah. Can you it, add man. a slash and, and put Neff, you know, just in, in um, you know, it is a nod to me and our relationship. He just said Neff. Um, like, um, apparently, Neff. Yeah, like, apparently you know, you're a nephew. Um, she's um, a Neff. <laughs> 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 Probably Marvel and Menace. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, um, well, listen, uh, that that kind of takes us into the topic. But before we get there, I do want to start the way that we would normally start, just to do a learning check in, because this is a learning show. So uh, generally, I like to ask at the beginning, uh, what did you study, read, or live this week that taught you something, and what can you share? Just something that you you either studied, wrote about, read about, or that you lived you know, you experienced this week that taught you a lesson? Yeah, I'll jump in. So um, earlier this week, I wrote a little article on my Substack about how I, as a parent, choose schools for my kid. And so um, it just got me to thinking in terms of like folks that are like, oh, test scores aren't important, or this Mm -hmm. is important. And like, you know, so I just... You know, wrote down a, a a list of things that were important to me in terms of like when I choose schools for my kids. So if you guys, I'll, I can't put it in the comments because I don't have access to these new comments and stuff. But I will definitely uh, put it on the Facebook in order for you guys to check it out. Mm-hmm. Love That's it, dope, dope. Sharif. Yeah, yeah. I, you know what? I, I had opportunity to to do a little uh, insight with my sister. So she wrote a wrote a piece about her experience of learning math as a student in Iran, and then how as a, uh, a math teacher, she implemented 
you know, um, some of those same, you know, strategies. And, you know, one of the things, and I don't think we ever talked about it in depth, you know, she's like, you know, over 10, 15 years younger than me. So I don't think we, either one of us talked about our experience in school in Iran, like at that, at least as a math class, but it was interesting. It was the same thing, even over, over a course of a decade, like neither one of us saw an open-ended response. I mean, I'm sorry, a multiple choice kind of test or question until we got here, you know, and then we both mm -hmm. felt like, you know, I remember going to high school, felt like it was cheating. I'm like, Oh my gosh, the answer is right here. You know, where we had been accustomed and, and, developed as as young math students to think problems through and and prove your answer and write everything out um and so it was interesting to read her piece um and it was so similar to my experience of of learning math and why you know um students in america struggle with math so much right and and what we can learn from other cultures that we may you know that society looks at as you know secondary or mm -hmm third world where it's just like yeah but they got you know what who's actually third world when you look at who can do math you know um and those kind of things so um it was it was just really interesting to see you know that uh that we shared that experience even though we hadn't really you know spoken about it but, um so that was it was a uh, you know eye-opening i appreciate that um because math is boring mm -hmm. um and you know so i'm talking like See, see, you guys like to talk as adults about these things. <laughs> I'm talking from personal experience as a student who still feels tra traumatized by the um, the episodic way in which math was taught mm -hmm. and how, like, I'm a person who needs context. One thing needs to learn, lead to another. I need a story. I need the full story. I don't like bits and pieces. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't like episodes of things. And telling me, oh, this will make sense to you two years from now. Mm. <laughs> man, come on. And then, you know, I was, I was older. So when I went on my fatherhood journey and I started thinking about this math stuff with my oldest, um, I forgot where I read it, but it was something that was talking about Singapore and that mm -hmm. their, their math books were like super thin and ours were just big, you know, honking books or whatnot. I remember thinking, yeah. why, couldn't I have, why couldn't I get the thin one? Why did I have to get the, you know, anyways, <laughs> America, that's why, because America. Um, before we jump in, you know, here's my thing that I learned this week. It's not something that I, I learned really, but it was a reflection that I had that came up. There's this story um, out of Wisconsin, um, and it, it's the title of the story is Wisconsin Congressman Calls TikTok Digital Fentanyl. Uh, and, and just the headline, the headline alone got me like hooked. I was like, what? Wait. <laughs> so I did not know this. There are two congressmen, Rubio and uh, I forgot the other guy's name from from Wisconsin. They are they have a bill or something pending where they are attempting to basically outlaw TikTok in the United States. Uh, and, you know, upon doing some digging and whatnot, TikTok, the version that we have for our kids in the United States is not the version that the Chinese give That's their own kids. Not. So yep. the version that they have in China actually limits them to 40 minutes a day and it has educational content and none of the nonsensical jumping off of roofs and stabbing yourself in the eye and like, you know, any of that stuff that we have, all the vulgar kind of not serious stuff that we're pumping our, our kids with. So it's super addictive. It's super stupid. Uh, and it's and it's uh, uh, and it's uh, uh, popular. So if you wanted to do something to another country without like shooting a missile at them like without releasing a bomb, get to their youth, get in the, in, the, in the ear of the youth, get them addicted to something that they do for 24 hours a day and make it super stupid so that their brain deteriorates and that they don't ever get serious about anything. That'd be like an excellent thing. Now, that wasn't my full revelation. My full revelation is I'm kind of a lax dad on these type of things. As much as I get props for being a father and being a good dad, I do lots of stuff where I'm like, you know, I listen, I have to reflect and think, you know, there's this difference between being super lenient and being super tight mm -hmm. and there's this middle ground and it's not ever easy to know where it is mm -hmm. and uh my reflection this week was i'm usually on the side of laissez-faire parenting mm -hmm. like i don't you know i don't like banning phones i don't like taking away things i don't feel like you develop you know a resistance to anything by just somebody prohibiting you from having it right anyways i know that, that never worked for me so anyways that was my reflection i'm not the world's best dad i got some things that like you know i figure out along the way and uh you know hey it oh, just yeah. is what it is i think oh, it's yeah. ron johnson is the uh the senator from um from uh wisconsin, wisconsin. wisconsin the bill, is that his name yeah would you say again ron johnson yeah 
All right. Well, listen, we're going to look for the uh, the link and drop it into the, the uh, comments again. It's called Wisconsin Congressman Calls TikTok Digital Fentanyl, which is a dope title. Uh, makes me jealous that I didn't write that myself. Well, let's roll into our show tonight. We're talking about fathers again and fatherhood. This is an, uh, a father powered podcast. Uh, black men, but you know what? If you are brown or Bayesian or white or Chinese, whatever you are, black, white, Puerto Rican, everybody just a freaking, it just be whatever you want it to be. This is still going to be good for you because you know what? As men across all different lines, we have stuff going on where we have to figure out the, this father thinghood thing, fatherhood thing. And then at the same time, relating it to education. We have educational leaders in my mind that don't always pay attention to fathers as an entity. We talk mm -hmm. about parent engagement. We talk about, I think oftentimes we're talking about moms. We're not talking about dads, even when, when educationists are talking about us. Tonight, our guest is uh, Harrison Peters, CEO of MCEL, which is Men of Color in Educational Leadership and a former state turnaround superintendent in Providence, Rhode Island. God bless you. Uh, his drive for education was sparked by uh, one 10th grade teacher who said that he was not college material and another who said, I love you, I believe in you, and I refuse to let you fail. Listen to the difference between those mm. two uh, um, those two types of educators in the life of a black man. I want to play a portion of this clip that introduces Harrison, and then we will bring him into the show uh, on the other side of this. So if you guys will, let me know, thumbs up or thumbs down if you can For hear For UWF this. alum Harrison Peters, home is where the heart is. The most pressing memory is just my grandmother and how hard she worked to raise two rambunctious boys. A turbulent childhood and family crisis took young Harrison and his brother out of Houston, Texas through some divine intervention to his grandmother's house on Lakeview Avenue in Pensacola, Florida. She saw what could happen if I ensure that my kids, my grandkids get a good education. I think about all the tough lessons I think about me being dropped off in the corner and trying to sneak in the house and she's sitting right there on the porch. Say, ah, ah, you know the rules. That street light right there, when it came on, you had better be home. Peters grew up just blocks away from Pensacola High School, across the road from the A Street Park, a place where formal education and life lessons only the street can teach intersect. A lot of my education came from this place. I spent many days and evenings and weekends uh, right out here. There's a powerful learning that occurs out here. And there are some guys that I ran with and played with and sat on that bench right there and talked and joked with that didn't make it. And there were some that were. But there's a value that happens in the community. Harrison's grandmother, Alberta, raised the boys as best she could and turned his education over to the faculty and staff at PHS. Oh, look at him. Look at my man. Let's go. How you doing, boy? <laughs> How you doing? Good to see you, man. Oh, man. Good to see you. Looking like, looking like new money. But Peters was still a ship without a sail, a class clown. When I was a teacher, I would characterize my students as fruit. So I had my peaches, my plums, and my apples, and I had my coconuts. Needless to say, I was a coconut. A 10th grade science teacher, Dr. East, called him out. She said, boy, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I said, well, Doc, I'm tall, I play basketball, I'm pretty good, I'd love to go to college and play basketball. She looked at me and she said, boy, sit down. You're not college material. So I sat down. Harrison loved basketball. He found a mentor and father figure in his coach, current PHS principal, David Williams. I think I carry a favor with the yearbooks yeah, there. Really? <laughs> coach was my harshest critic, but he was my biggest supporter and my biggest cheerleader. And you don't always find that balance. And I remember he was giving me one of those tough conversations one time at the gym. He said, this person is giving up on you. This person is giving up on you, son. I'm not going to give up on you, but you had better get it together. The sport connected him to coaches and teammates like current PHS boys basketball coach and fellow UWF alum Terrence Harris, building those lifelong relationships. Y'all keep running. He said, well, how long we got to run? Well, you run until I get tired. And I'm like, well, coach, you're not doing nothing. How are you going to get tired? That's my point. <laughs> I love that so much. Uh, let's bring in our guest tonight, Harrison Peters, CEO 
uh, leader. There's so much to unpack in that uh, in that clip. I played it that far because uh, I saw different things in the story about how you grew up, but it ends, you know, there's a lot more that folks could go and, and look and watch in that video, but it ends with the relationships that you do need uh, along the way, even when people are doubting you and even when people are underestimating you. If you could get to those folks who, who can pump you up and show you the way, you still can make it. And here's the thing that to Ray's point earlier, when he said that, you know, Ray's name that he has up right now is son, father, uncle, brother, whatnot. We talk about fatherhood as if it's a destination, but I like to talk about fathering as a verb, as a thing that you can do, even when someone's not your own child. Fathering is something that we all have a certain quantity of in us, and you can do it as coaches, as teachers, as principals, as friends, as a friend of a friend's dad, you know, who sees something in somebody or whatnot. We should always be on the lookout for fathering, the potential to father. Harrison, thank you for joining the show, brother. Thanks for having me. Really, really excited to be here. So uh, tell us the rest of the story. What happened? <laughs> so you found some some good positive influences. <laughs> How did you make it to here to where you are now today? I, the, you know, probably if you listened before and, and a little bit later on, it said uh, a lot of uh, my grandmother had a uh, second grade education, couldn't read or write, but she had a Ph.D. in discipline. Mm -hmm. uh, so, hey, that Ph.D. in discipline carried me a long way. Uh, and then a lot of people just not giving up on me, a lot of people giving me second, third and even fourth chances. And then certainly, you know, last but not least, I believe it had to be some divine intervention in there somewhere, because part of the story talks about I, I'm the oldest. I'm the oldest of three boys and um, I made it and my other two brothers didn't. So I know in there somehow some long nights on my grandmother's knees praying that uh, God will find favor or fate will find favor. Some man, some father would find me out in the streets and bring me on home. So it was, it was uh, brother, I'm telling you, um, the, the conversation about what fatherhood is and who can be a father and who should be fathered, uh, it resonates. Sometimes it was just a cat outside the liquor store saying, young boy, going home. So mm -hmm. the value of the, the ideology of father for me was just absolutely critical because I didn't go grow up with one. So everyone and everything was a father. And there weren't always things that folks that would tell you what to do. Um, a lot of times you just sort of learn what not to do and listening to the old cats on that park bench drinking those 40s. You know, believe it or not, that's fatherhood in its own way. Um, so for me, it was really, like I said, that PhD in discipline, uh, folks giving me second, third or fourth chances and a little bit of divine, a lot of bit of divine mention in there as well. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot of lip service paid to fatherhood. Do you think that the lip service lives up to the reality? Do we value fathers like we should? I don't, I don't believe it lives to black fatherhood. I think there's a fear of black fathers, um, mm -hmm. to be honest. And fatherhood is something that I struggle with the most. I've got my, my youngest son just turned 18 yesterday and my oldest son is 24. And, and I tell him that there's nothing in me that say that I'm getting it right or that I've gotten it right. But what I will tell you is I ain't going nowhere. I ain't leaving mm -hmm. and I ain't going to be left. Mm -hmm. um, so I think when you think about how, and, and earlier you talked about the school systems and schools and, and how they sort of bastardize sort of we want father engagement. We want parent engagement when we give them real engagement. If it doesn't come in this nice little box, then we don't want that kind of engagement. Mm -hmm. And the reality is that's not how fathers are. So I, I think of, 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 of two things when I think um, with my sons, um, anybody can be a father. And that's the first thing that I tell them. I said, you know, I, I teach you to make good decisions and be respectful. And anybody, you know, we, we've gotten into a spot where we will call my dad. No, anybody can be your dad. And if he has to be your dad, then when you get home, then your real dad going to have a conversation. So I think, A, just helping fathers understand and, and getting back to that space where it's OK for the village to be the father. But you said something earlier, and I think it's it's sad that it's almost when you say parent engagement or fatherhood it's almost synonymous with our good sisters and women in education but why would education behave differently we, we we're treated the same way by law enforcement mm -hmm. we're treated the mm -hmm. same way by the court system so education is not going to be an this anomaly and say yeah we want you 
Um, obviously, I think we have in our position to do some of the best, most powerful work. And I believe fathers can change education. I, I, I'm convinced of that. I mean, there's nothing that doesn't convince me of that. But I also think that the conditions have to be set. And then part of our challenge is from our own experiences in school. We we still have sort of those experiences and those traumatic sort of rhythms that we've had in, during our own experience that that's the last place we sort of want to go. You know, to the other brothers here, uh, Ray and Sharif, you both have ran schools. How'd you open the doors? I'm super cynical. I'm a cynical black man. I'm a cynical black dad out here. Uh, my experience is from this side of the fence. What did, what did y'all see in terms of strategies or techniques that people had to like get us in the, in the room and, and yeah, as part of the equation? Yeah, you, you have to be intentional about bringing black men into, into, the, into the realm. And so uh, when we send out parent communications or when we make phone calls, not only are we calling the mom that's on the contact list, but if the dad is on the contact list, we call him the dad too, unless there's a note that says we can't call the dad, right? Mm -hmm. and so it's important for, for both parties to get the same information because a lot of times what you'll have is if they're not in the same household, then you'll get one you'll get one set of information that's like uh that's that's pilfered through uh, the initial set. And so like everybody's not on the same page in terms of like how how they need to show up, right? And so, you know, you give everybody the opportunity to come to the table with suggestions. And if, you know, folks don't choose to come, it's not because you didn't allow them to come. It's not because they didn't have the information to come or the word at all. It's because they made the act of choice to not come. Right. But I think that when we are intentional about bringing black dads to the table, we go above and beyond to make them feel welcome. Right. Because, you know, as as uh, as, as Peter said earlier, you know, a, a lot of a lot of folks, you know, when they think about school, they think about their own traumas that are associated when they went to school. Right. And so we have to demystify the traumas that dads went through when they were in school to let them know that, hey, listen, this is your kid. We approaching this different. And the, re the way that you can do that is by welcoming dads. Mm -hmm. Some of them schools are still doing the same thing they did before, too, by the way. Sharif, it's all your fault, Sharif. Tell us more. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was interesting. I mean, I would say some of it is, you know, could be my fault just from like an orientation um, perspective. Like I, I was literally trying to think, like, when did I deliberately say, hey, guys, we got to bring fathers in. I don't remember doing that as a team. I just remember fathers always being present, you know. Um, I mean, it's a, almost three decades in schools. And I just never remember not having dads always around you know single fathers married fathers i i think if i had to think about one thing they could also see themselves within our school right like we had black men who were who were teachers it wasn't like hey you know a black school with 99 percent, you know uh white women for example right where they're like hey you know what like we're like i, th I think part of it was one how we looked at community and for mm -hmm. us community was inclusive of black men you know like that's I, I so i i can't even think of anything deliberate like we didn't do donuts for dad and hey we're gonna do this specifically for to try to get these black men to come they were just always a part of the community and i think if you're community oriented then you're not you don't have a tendency to erase half the population you know like it was just mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I was just like hey this was I, I think because we were community oriented it was like you know that's where we spent our focus then it became a place that you know parents grandparents uh you know foster parents you know fathers you know like the, the pastor right like you know matter of fact, uh you know one of the reverends in our neighborhood he was at bmec he mm -hmm. always comes to bmec and you know what mm -hmm. he always would come to the schools too you know like that was just part of his orientation as you know uh the pastor at at bible way church he was and he wasn't the only one but he was like always there you know i saw him at b -Man. i was like man i haven't seen him since i left shoemaker but here he was he was like yo man i'm i'm, I'm proud that this is continuing right because and here's a black man he didn't have a child in our school but he was a presence you know so back to son Anyone father uncle brother Hey, bro, he, yeah. had a, he had a whole flock of children in your school. Exactly. That's what I mean. I mean, he didn't have like, but the fatherhood plus the manhood existed within him. And I think we respected that as a community. And that's why, why they were just 
they were always there. You know, I, I was at my daughter's track meet and I saw Brother Swans. Brother Swans put a couple kids through there, but he was also a mentor, right? So I see him at a track meet an hour away from Philly and we were talking about Shoemaker and, you know, and his presence and his children, but also all the, the folks that he supported uh, within the community. So I, I think for me, it goes back to community and not trying to erase a particular population um, and having a wider orientation for you, you, you know, don't see all these signs. You don't see all these signs. You 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 see. Did you just do the hook? You, you just did the hook. You see somebody from you Shoemaker. Did, no, you, you see did the hook. You saw somebody from Shoemaker. You saw a person uh, at BMEC that was associated with Shoemaker. I see where you're going. Stop it, bro. Stop it. I see. I see where I see where you're going. I didn't know where you were going at first. I said, stop it. <laughs> Anyways, uh, let me say this. Uh, for, well, first, for people listening, uh, you heard Sharif say a couple of times BMEC, uh, which is this amazing conference of black male educators that comes together um, in big numbers. And it's something that's rare. and You're not going to see it very often in the country because black males who are in education are just as every bit as invisible as black men who are involved in their children's lives. Nationally speaking, and I'm only, you know, I'm talking about the media, somebody who works within uh, storytelling and media and journalism and all those things, I can tell you, to me, it's a hidden, it's a hidden property. But something I would ask all three of you, and Harrison, I'll bring you in on this, you know, um, as black males are being encouraged to participate in schools and in schooling, uh, you, we're getting the message like, you know, uh, you're irresponsible if you're not part of this or whatnot. To be very honest with you, I like to leave a lot of things up to my wife to handle a lot of things so that we don't have no problems uh, with the school. Because, uh, but But I will say, uh, I don't like the way that Sharif um, talked about donuts for dads because I'm not going to ever diss donuts uh, for, for donuts. <laughs> I and love I donuts. Tell, yeah, I love donuts. And I can tell you this much. One of the ways that I did get involved was there was a very specific African-American male or African-American father night at school. And mm. I was like, well, I got to come to this because it's called African-American <laughs> father night. I can't like I can't uh, delegate this one. So, so you know, I went. <laughs> you know, he like I can't delegate. This can't one. delegate this. Uh, there's some other stuff you can delegate. This ain't one of them. Uh, so, anyways, I go, uh, and then it became a yearly thing, and they had it every year, right? Uh, but I, you know, it, it 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 hit me when I went. It was the first time that I had ever been called to school for anything specifically, where it felt like mm -hmm. it was a real invitation to me specifically. Mm -hmm. And just being there, it was like looking around like, oh, yeah, yeah, this is interesting that y'all got us here for, you know, you know, you even called us for anything else anyways. But one thing I noticed when that group of brothers got together for that was that there was these stories that come up. Like, I think one of you mentioned, I think it was you, Ray, that said, you know, you make sure the father gets the same information. It was pretty common to hear from fathers. They always called the mom, don't call me and we're not together anymore or something like that. They never call me and let me know. Uh, mm -hmm. If it's a sick child or if it's a, you know, something happening or whatever, they can always call the mother first because of the assumption that the mother is the one, the only one that needs the information. But anyways, this question I was going to get to with the three of you as a lay as a lay parent, you know, on the outside. Do you ever think about the fact when you're trying to encourage black men or black fathers to get involved that when we get there, um, we're going to be having a unique interaction because we're the only ones where the staff is nothing like us? Like out of all your constituents, we're the one group there. Does anybody study that or research that or think through when you're asking us to come down there and do that? You're you're inviting us into a unique experience that no one else is having because nobody in the schools looks like us. I got three things that I think have an opinion about and I don't even have a damn answer. So just know this. <laughs> so I also think that we've got to be careful um, around conflating this notion of fatherhood and being involved like in in school activities and if you look traditionally and culturally i mean black fathers have never necessarily been in the school or come to the school but it doesn't necessarily mean that we're not great fathers and we're not actively engaged and there was a time where I think I thought that they just wanted fathers, black fathers to be involved because they wanted us to come down there and walk the school and control the kids and do their job. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think part of it is how do we bifurcate, but also bring the conversation back together, this notion of fatherhood being great fathers, but also being engaged in things that are happening in school. Um, and because I, I think it's cultural. 
Um, the, and then the other piece is I experienced this a lot as a um, when I was um, deputy superintendent and and superintendent is the, the, the court system has put so many obstacles in place that some of our fathers can't do anything above dropping Preach. their kids off. Mm-hmm. They, they can't mm-hmm. be involved because legally there are policies that prevent them from um, um, being involved. And I don't want to send this message that our, our fathers and our black men are broken. That's not what I'm saying. But there's so many policies and procedures. If you have a record, if you've done this, then you can't be involved in this program. And we set up this sort of community-based restorative conversation to if a dad, by, ha- by happenstance, had made a, a mistake and, and, and has a record, Is there a path to restore that so he can have uh, an opportunity to participate in his students' schooling experience, too? And I also find that that's a big roadblock to some of our folks as well. Yeah, I think y'all are I I think y'all are trying to make it hard on us. That's that's (laughs) I think all y'all educationists like like, you know, you send home so much homework, first of all, number one. You want to make us look bad to our kids because you send it home. <laughs> Teach in the school. Don't send it home in the form of homework and make me look bad to my kids because at home I know everything. I can't, you can't be like showing me out. Oh, dad, can you help me with this math homework? Girl, what was the math doing in your school? What were they doing in your classroom? This is what I want to know. No, I, you, what? I think y'all do this on purpose. Just, so, to, you so, know, go ahead. Go ahead, one, brother. One way to look at that, Chris. And one thing that we do at our school is that we try to build community with our parents, right? So like in instances in which uh, parents don't understand the work that's coming home, we bring parents in and we give them a, a crash course in, in, in what to expect in terms of like high rigorous academic standards and the type of work that uh, that their, their kids are going to be bringing home. We also provide them with online resources. So that if they don't understand something, they could go to like a, a, um, a Khan Academy or they could watch a video in order to be able to uh, uh, coach their kids through a, a certain uh, a certain skill set, whatever. Right. So I think it's really important for us to uh, arm parents with resources so that our parents can be uh, integral parts in, in the educational lives of their students. I really wish to be and I'm not even joking. I am being <laughs> honest with you. I really wish that there was a way brace yourself Harrison to test us as parents for those that would want to volunteer for it at the beginning of each grade to say, this is what what's going to be coming up this year or whatnot to sh- just for parents like adult learning to show where our gaps are. Right. Like, I don't know why learning has to stop at grade 12. We need much more robust systems. Like what you just said, Ray, mm-hmm. like ways to like, I want the help sometimes I don't want, I won't be insulted. I will be insulted if you have my child bringing home stuff I can't do. And now I don't look like I'm the genius that I need to be for my children. Right. So, <laughs> but why, but why? Like, I, I mean, I, that's a very interesting. That's one way to look at it. That is one way to look at it. That's the best way to look at it. Keep going with what you're going to say. If my kid comes home with something, I don't know, whatever, and I don't know it, I'm not going to feel some kind of way. You know what I mean? Like, if anything, I'm, I'm, I think it's opportunity to engage. And, you know, they may be teaching, they may teach me something, even if it's not like to proficiency, but there's like sharing it. What I'm most would be most curious about, like, how are they thinking about it? Mm-hmm. They are struggling. Mm-hmm. How, right? Like, I think it's an opportunity to engage. I ain't trying to master their homework. I'm really not. You know, I may, I may read their articles. I've read the same books as, as some of them, you know, just because I'm like, oh, I'm so curious about that article, that, that book. But I don't know if I want to, you know, necessarily enter. I'm not necessarily interested in mastering 12th grade again or 11th grade again, you know, depending on, depending on the subject, you know, stop. But I think it's opportunity to it. engage. It is. This, is, this is what, this is so. Like, why, so, why you want to master their homework? You know what I mean? So just... this is, listen, <laughs> listen, you know, uh, Ishmael, what's his name? Jimenez. Jimenez, right? Mm-hmm. He's a, he's a teacher. You know, all these other teachers that you know. So if you had a problem with social studies or math or something like this, your network is packed as such that you could phone a friend. There are positions that parents can be in where the phone a friend is not going to work. <laughs> where yeah. you do not have anybody. Your child has that just opened up 18 problems on a page yeah. 
Mm. And y'all need to stop with these worksheets too. Yeah, That's but the there's also there's, stop there's, with the worksheets. What is wrong with y'all? There's, there's, commu- there's community resources, right? So there's also libraries in the local communities that do homework help. Uh, Sometimes so after school, uh, mm-hmm. after school activities. So for example, at our school, we do a homework club, right? And so it's not restricted. It's, so it, it, you know, parents can pay for it, but if you can't afford it, we also provide slots in order for us to make sure that it's equitable in terms of who shows up or whatever, right? But we pay mm-hmm. teachers uh, to come in and give uh, give students additional tutoring uh, so that when they get home, they have their homework done, right? So like one of the, one of the things that, that could help with the situation is homework club, but then also um, looking at the resources in your community to see if you have libraries that are, that, that are um, offering homework help. Harrison, what would you, what, would, what advice, I think you're on mute there, brother. Um, what advice would you give to this parent that I'm talking about, this, this father that doesn't want to look shameful? You know what I mean? We, we got pride. Y'all act like we don't have pride. We do. So, first of all, I, you know, I just, I, I, the question that I have is, why do you send kids home with homework that they can't do? Thank you. Yeah. You know, I, you know, that, and that, that's the thing that I had. That's the conversation that I have with teachers. Um, we looked at research around homework. We looked at research around social promotion and retention. And my question is, so w- what is the definition of homework? Like, w- can we norm in our school building around what we mean by homework and why we send it home? Because if, if I send you some send home something that you can't do, then I'm not sure that I've done my job as a professional. And I'm not saying, I mean, I know that there are exceptions to the rule. I know that there's a whole spectrum of those things, mm-hmm. but that's part of our role because. Sound like some homework bashing folks, right? These three. Bruh, I feel I so disavow, <laughs> I disavow. I disavow too. I mean, you know what? Y'all can disavow all you want. I feel seen. I feel seen and heard by this brother feel seen right heard. now. Hey, but so, sometimes, sometimes you got to allow students to struggle with work. Not all the time, right? But there has to be sometimes where you where you allow students to struggle with work, so that you know when you when you need to put the interventions in and when you need to reteach a certain thing. So, like for example, if I send you home with something that I taught during the day and you struggle with it at night, that doesn't necessarily mean that I didn't teach it to you during the day. That means that you didn't get it. And so now we got to come back in and we got to reteach so that when you take it home the next time, I know you get it. But so I you can't program say myself all night yeah. doing it wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. And so then you got to come back in and I got to deprogram you in order to do it right now. Which makes yeah, your I mean, dep- job but it depends on. Difficult. But it also depends on, on the child and assignment, right? Because I, I do believe that, you know, one of the things that we should be teaching kids, and this goes back to my opening, right, with like how we learned math in Iran, how we have here. Because what a lot of people will take that message and like, all right, well, I'm going to give them something much too easy. And they're just going to practice stuff that's not pushing them to be smarter, more resourceful, blah, blah, blah. Like what I want to do, even if they don't know how to do it, what I want to send them home with is how do you be resourceful in this moment, right? Mm-hmm. Do you go to your notes and, yeah. and restudy? Do you go to uh, Khan Academy or YouTube or Kill Parker's page? Like, what are you doing as a, no, you know, as a resourceful that. student that's not only self-advocating, but also like challenging yourself because a whole, I'm guarantee you a whole lot of educators will be like, all right, well, they're on this level, they're third grade level. I'm going to give them first grade level and that's all they're going to practice. Right. There's no way that that kid is going to advance at the, and when we talk about like black kids, even the ones who are intelligent and how they slip backwards, they come to school or they come to a grade with the skills and you just see them slipping backwards when you're not paying, you know, you're not noticing. Some of it is because they ain't getting no meaningful. It's, it's like just right. Some things are too hard. Some things are too easy. And what's the just right? And it doesn't mean that they have it perfected. It doesn't mean that they're not going to struggle. But what are the resources that they can use? If they're armed like- with, with good notes and good resources and good website and the foundation, they can figure it out. Oh, like, so, I, no, I, I, want, I see people now like, I don't want my kids doing any homework. <laughs> I don't want them to research. I don't want them to read. I just want them to come home and, and play and, and just and like, no, stop, no, stop. No, no. Like, you, know some work. Time, you know what? Yeah. Home is for... It's, home it's is a lot of laziness okay. out here in these okay. streets. First the wussification of, of American students. First of all, I don't feel like you answered Harrison's question because Harrison yes, said, Harrison said they studied homework and they asked the question, what is it for? which to me sounds like a good inquiry to start a bigger discussion about. 
Principal Kefele says they should not be sending homework that the children can't do. The purpose of homework is reinforcement, not new learning. Okay. Let me, let me, all right. Let me give you one, one small example. Principal Kefele, thank you for seeing and thank hearing the Principal Kefele. I'm going to give, I'm going to add, and, and mind you, mind you, I, I grew up, and, and again, well, I know we always talk about, oh, you went to that school. This, this, the same school, right? And so I went to Nathamo Sasa, then in Iran. And the way they looked at homework, and the way that American schools look at homework, I can see why a place like Iran produces far, you know, um, you know, the, the percentage of engineers and doctors that they produce in those countries out east. I can see why. Right. Because one, like the intellectual rigor that it takes, it ain't just in school. It, it, intellectual rigor should be happening and learning should be happening. But I'm going to give you an example of something I did not know. And I and I like had to push and I failed at it. So one of the assignments one year, and I was this is elementary school, was the question of what is the what is the uh, it was martial arts theory class. Oh boy, yeah. What was the what is the pound of pressure it takes that it would take to um, that a dog exerts? Mm -hmm. Like what is the what is the 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 pound of pressure? I didn't know that it wasn't something specifically taught. If if it was, it would just be memorization. Right. And so but what I did, what I did as an elementary school student, I'm literally calling around. We went to the library. Right. We were trying to find out, like, where do you find out what's the I even called a veterinarian office. Like, hey, how many pounds of pressure, you know, square inch does it take? Right. Like literally. And it was not something that I knew, but it was something it was a thought process, the intellectual rigor and discipline of thinking and problem solving that I was going through. If, if, if I just knew the answer, then it would just be recall. This and is that is the I, lowest I, form of, of learning. You this, know what I'm saying? I, so I'm going to agree with that part. But what I'm going to say to all three of y'all as educationists and me as the resident. Uh, we need more here, homework, not less. Bruh, <laughs> what I need for you to do is do an equity walk. I need you to take a bus and a half to work and then take one to go pick your kid up from school and take them home on the bus and spend your last eight, nine, ten dollars at a McDonald's because you ain't gonna feel like cooking when you get home or whatever, and take them back to an apartment by yourself in an apartment on the bus and get home at about six, six thirty, six thirty-eight, and mm -hmm. know that they have a routine of having to take a bath and having to get some other things done for the night and go to bed so that you can get to bed in time so that you can get on a bus the next day and go to work. See, education is, is the right way to hold a violin. So, so educationists with is pensions, a, with I, pensions I and one. college degrees or whatnot probably have never been on this bus. But can, what, I'm, can, what I'm saying is, yeah, then what you need that. to do, what you need to do is you also need to have multiples who have a worksheet that has 16 problems on it. And they're each stuck on number seven or number 11 or number 16. And one of them is crying. One of them is ready to give up the other blah, 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 blah. Before you start wondering what's going on at school during the day. Like, why mm -hmm. am I doing this? Why is my house now? Like, we're supposed to be in our nighttime routine right now. Were you supposed to be eating and then taking a bath and then doing some other things or whatnot? Maybe, hopefully, having some fun for a little bit fun, before you go fun. to bed. Typical yeah. American yeah. response. <laughs> oh, I want to have fun. <laughs> I want to have fun. And wait a minute. This is my problem. I think Americans, including Christopher Stewart, they have a schizophrenic relationship with some of this stuff. All right. Okay. So, one, so on the other side, Chris will be like, hey, this is. The uh, they got to compete internationally. Let me tell you what they're doing internationally. They are on that. On they're that driving board. the kids to suicide. Wait, wait a minute. They're, That's what they're their, doing internationally. Not all of them. No, you just <laughs> talked about TikTok. Yeah. You just talked about TikTok, yeah. right? Like it's like, yeah. no, shut this down. You're this is actually learning, right? But learning is looked at more comprehensive. I can tell you, as a kid, I had plenty of teardrops on my on my book report that I had to rewrite because it was uh, it was sloppy. And last I checked, Mary McLeod Bethune was walking ten miles to and from school, oh, right? Boy. So we went you from, and I'm not saying that that's right, but what you I'm saying crazy. is we went from that to. We just want to have fun. Like, no, you don't need fun. Get to work. Let's did you go. Hear what I, just said, to do. I, I, I don't think that you heard <laughs> I, what I said. I though. did hear what you said. Get and what I'm saying is 630 to seven o'clock. Listen, I'm not saying home. that you should be doing homework for right. three hours at home, you know, and elementary okay, let's, school. Let's stop there. I'm not saying should, that. How long should you have of home? Because sometimes your window before getting home, bedtime, eating, uh, bath, all that stuff is about three hours. On that bus, uh, can a kid so, read? So, 
Can so, a kid read on that bus? Or are they playing seen, TikTok seen, and video seen, games? Can I've they do homework on the way. bus though? I've can seen, they like be writing I've, on on I've seen it. I don't I don't I don't condone it, but I've seen it. Not 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 at all. I've seen I've seen oh New York City subways, I've seen parents reading to their kids, I've seen their kids reading to them. And so there's no you I don't know why black fathers don't want to mess with y'all. This is hey, what's wrong with y'all system. I seen it with black fathers doing it. Yeah, like yeah, I've yeah. seen listen, yeah, I, I, I just the homework. I want to go back to the homework piece. Yeah, yeah, good. So so if you so if you're struggling with homework and you have a really good teacher, then that teacher is going to be able to. So first of all, if you're teaching, don't just come in and mark check and, and, and mark if the homework is done. Really give these kids feedback in terms of like if they're doing their homework correctly, uh, go through the steps. Uh, if you go through the steps and you and you and you really like hone in, then you can give these kids like real time feedback on like where they messed up, give them opportunities to do those problems over again. Uh, we use small group instruction to where if a kid didn't master a certain standard, then we're going back, we're reteaching that standard and we're teaching it in a different way. If you're a teacher out here and a kid and a kid didn't master uh, whatever it is you taught, please don't teach them the same way. They're not going to learn it. Mm. Yeah, just like y'all don't teach black men the same way because we're oh. not going to learn it. Because everything you're saying right now sounds like some real BS. This is why we hate your school. <laughs> this is like you're talking about a violin. I'm telling you, bro, what it's like to take a bus home to pick up your like one bus to go to the daycare or to go to the school or to go wherever you got to pick up your kid and another bus to get them home. And you got to get them something to eat on the way home. And then when you get that, you got, they got to have a routine. You got to have a routine Routines and, and don't, important. and God, God forbid you have more than one. Like if you have more than one, the whole homework thing, like I'm crying over problem number eight and I don't know how to do this and blah, blah, blah. And then your cable then got shut off your, 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 your internet then got shut off. Blah, blah. Listen, this isn't, this isn't about awfulizing the situation. I am saying that there's going to be somebody who knows exactly what I'm talking about though. No, I, right? I don't disagree exactly with you, but should we not about. give homework because you have yes. a long bus ride home? Is that's that what exactly you're saying? It. Yes. That's exactly what I'm saying. That's stop it. You should have schoolwork. It's called school. Yep. It's supposed to happen. It's at called school. learning and learn. You you also say like schools, all the learning shouldn't happen just in school. So what happens on the outside? Just the fun. And I and I'm not saying that you can't learn from fun. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying like there's I'm certain places <laughs> where fun. the fun uh, is prioritized go, See, over Harrison's the intellectual rigor. Let Harrison in here because he's. The, well, he what you got, something. Harrison? Tell, yeah, he's. You didn't. You didn't raise two two yeah. young men. Like what? What you got, bro? I, just, I, I think part of what we're we're what we're also naming is just who has access to what. Sharif, I, I really appreciate how you downloaded the steps to your problem solving and, and how you found out the pound of the puppy. Um, that's having access to resources, being able to call, being a problem solver. I also believe that learning should extend well beyond the classroom. I think mm -hmm. we have to define what types of experience of learning opportunities. And then this Chris is, is no lie. They learn just from Tech Mobile though. That's what he's saying. He just wants them to play Tech Mobile <laughs> to have fun. And they'll be they'll learn. Not Tech Mobile. <laughs> I also have to I name know that, that, about play, right? that, but <laughs> I also have to name that we're privileged, but I'll just I'll give it just a privileged sort of response. So we were living in Chicago. You know I worked on the south side of Chicago about five, mm -hmm. five and a half years. Mm -hmm. And I remember taking my scout in Chicago, they don't have elementary schools as per se. They're all K eights and then you go to secondary school or high school. So I remember uh, my son taking him to a school enroll him because we had just transitioned from North Carolina and monitoring his progress, trying to be the good dad that I did. My wife, uh, his mom, she did all the education stuff because of my position and my role and all of that stuff. But I remember about a year later getting his standardized test scores. Not that I even care that, but just for kicks and giggles. And I looked at his scores and he had gone from like the 99th percentile to like the 89th percentile. But yeah, this report card was like all A's. Cap. So I'm struggling. <laughs> so I, I sit down with the teacher and the principal. And, you know, I want to unpack what's going on. You know, Kenny's Man, a great helper. And he's smart. So <laughs> then I started, I said, I said, well, let's unpack this. I said, I said, so, I said, so, I said, so by your, I said, so Kenny has the luxury of having two educated parents. My wife and I went to college. I said, he comes home, he reads for an hour. He's a voracious reader, so he's, he reads himself to sleep. He does his homework, he gets a snack, doesn't watch TV through the week. Um, 
eats a good dinner. We have family time. You know, everything that you ask me to do, by your definition, I am a great parent. I've done everything you've asked me to do. Yet he has slipped from the 99th to the 89th percentile. Who owns that responsibility? It damn mm-hmm. sure ain't a homework. Mm-hmm. And and you're saying this, night. you're saying this as an educator and two parents, both with college educations, both arriving at this place. Sharif knows this about me. I'm not, I don't have your profile, but I still ran into a math problem last year with the son where the school yeah. was missing, the school was missing a bunch of stuff. And I had to phone people. I had to phone a friend and like, this just doesn't seem right. Now, I have had more than one crying child because of stress and overload of the amount of homework brought home. And sometimes, I don't think teachers know, I've said this on the show a lot of times, when you've been through a lot of different teachers because you've got multiple kids and they have multiple teachers, you get to see different styles of teaching. You get to see which teachers do what. And I am sorry. Some of y'all feel lazy. Y'all seem to be loading our kids up with a bunch of stuff because other we have other teachers that get the work done and get the job done. And they still have to do stuff at home, like read a certain amount of time when they get home or whatever. But it, it doesn't feel like we're teaching them in those classes. In some of these other cases, we have crying children that are sitting there where we start crying, too, because we are like, this is too much. This is too much. Like, yeah. I feel it's too much. Well, listen, it's too oh. much. All, all these teachers, all these teachers at the beginning of the school, they have their back to school night, right? And so what I would do is I would no, recommend not all, but go ahead. I'm sorry. Go well, ahead. most, but most of them. If you if you're if you're in a school that's worth anything, then then folks are having back to school nights. And so what I would recommend is you go into back to school nights and you have a list of questions that you ask uh, these teachers in terms of like how they're going to pour into your child, right? So for example, you know, one question that I like to ask uh, teachers is. Um, how how are you going to get to know my child to know how to motivate her, right? And so I'm always mm-hmm. interested in, in, mm-hmm. in, in how a teacher responds or a teacher um, motivates the thinking of my child because every child, all 25, depending on if you're in New York City, you got 21 now with these learning uh, classroom, uh, whatever. Anyways, uh, 20, 25 kids, 25 different personalities, you can't teach them all the same. And you not you can't teach them the way you taught the kids last year because they ain't the same kids, and so you really got to get to know these kids like back and forth in order for you to know how to push them. I would like to make a proposal here, which just is because y'all educationists, I'm tired of y'all. So listen, I, there's lots of states that have these like home visits as a formal system, not like as something that they do randomly or whatnot. I know in St. Paul they actually got state money to be able to do them. And I think it revealed a lot to the educators that they hadn't, you know, it improved the practice. It just improved it by doing home visits or whatnot. I don't know how much of a focus there was in that on them relating to also the fathers and the father part of this, because I I was a parent in one of those districts and never got a home visit. (laughs) But when Sharipi talking about like, oh, my, I'm going to pull out a violin because the dad has to. Now I'm like, Sharif, you have to get on the bus now. Now you have to shadow that parent. You better shout it at. You got to get up at 430 in the morning in Minnesota in the cold and put that baby on a bus and get that baby to, to, to wherever they need to be and get them home the same way in sub-zero weather. And then we're going to talk about your violin. I'm thinking that we nationally need parent shadowing. That's what I need y'all to do. Shadow the dad. What do y'all think? Y'all down for I mean, it? You do I mean, I, I think as a as a concept, like yeah, I, I you know I, I like that. You know, I think that's a concept. I, I know some sometimes uh, politicians will do that as well, just to get a better understanding of the, of the constituency. That doesn't remove the fact that like there's there's work to be done, right? Like there's work to be done. Like as I I, I do think there's a tendency sometimes, particularly in this country, and, and mind you, this is somebody who spent some of their time overseas, there's a there's a difference about how people think about learning. And we've talked about this on the show. We we agree less than 20% of your time is in inside of a building as a student, less than 20% of your time. So all the learning is, can't happen there. And we need to make sure that that 20% is the most effective education mm-hmm. as as possible. Yes, um, and, uh, and mind you, like even without just being in the community, being at you know, the schools where where staffers in Philly told me don't go to an S&T school because basically in Philly, 
that meant like you were in the in the hood and and people were struggling and I was at What's Turner. SMT? What's that? SMT. SMT. They basically, when I went to my, my first uh, week in the district, staffers said, don't go to a school that starts with an S or a T. Oh, OK. And they were basically profiling. <laughs> they were stuff. racially profiling um, the school. So, of course, I did the exact opposite because I'm, you know, I'm oppositional uh, like that. So I went to Turner then I went to Shaw. Then I went to Shoemaker, all mm-hmm. very similar profiles. And very similar stories without the weather of Minnesota, um, but folks like struggling and making sure that they're having, we had a high percentage of foster parents, et cetera, all, all the things. And yet folks were, folks were still doing, you know, the, the, the work. Now, what I would say, I, we did ask, we did make sure that, because, you know, to your point, when they get to middle and high school, they're seeing a lot of different teachers and sometimes they're not coordinating. Mm-hmm. And so each of them shouldn't be given an hour of homework you know, to a seventh grade, like, hey, you have Thank an hour, you. you have an hour, you have. No, I Thank agree you. with that. So Thank there you. should be some coordination. But mm-hmm. I also see just nationally, like, they don't need to do anything. Just let them go. Like, it's but the that's whole, the thing is, like, I can't look at it nationally. I'm looking at it. I'm a literal father with literal kids. And there was a difference when they were in elementary and they each had one teacher each. Mm-hmm. Then they get into the middle grades. And now each one of them has multiple teachers. Mm. Right. This goes back so, to mindset and systems, you know, though, right? Like that's part of what we talk about why, why schools and districts sometimes are dysfunctional. Is it's not just the thing; it's the systems, right? If you're not communicating on a team of teachers, the whole point of you being a team is that you're also working together in service of that child. And if you're not, not talking exactly, I mean, so not, that's a problem. Not. not the idea of homework, mm-hmm. right? Like the <laughs> idea that they're <laughs> the not homework is still jacked up. <laughs> I'm sorry. Instruction is jacked up in a whole lot of places. <laughs> Like, forget the homework. Instruction is jacked up. Yeah. So, so there's a, I don't know if you guys have ever done this. I, I think I may have done it like once or twice, but there's a bring your child to work day uh, mm-hmm. thing that happens every mm-hmm. year. Mm-hmm. And so one of the things that we're going to implement next year, uh, probably um, the in, in January, we're going to have a bring your, uh, we're going to have uh, parents come in as their kid day, right? So that you Shadow can type of thing. Meet you can now see and be exposed to how learning happens in an actual school during the school day with your child so that you can see it through, through their lens in terms of like how they're learning, how they're processing and like, uh, and just, and just how they, how they approach certain things uh, when put in certain situations. Right. Mm -hmm. You've heard me challenge crowds when we have had live shows before I dare parents to go spend a day as a high school student uh, for a day and reacquaint yourself with it. I dare you because uh, all the lovely stuff that you remember with your letter jacket or your prom or whatever, or whatever it is that you you hold in your mind. Well, you think working is bad. You'll go back to work with a better attitude the next day. You'll come back to work like, oh yeah, I hated y'all yesterday, but I went to high school for a day and now I feel better. Um, Harrison, and there's schools that so. push for equity for teachers and staff members to do that, principals to do that. You know, also follow. So not just do it from my office or from here. No, you are a student. Here's your roster. And then we're going to debrief at the end of the day. What was your experience but, like? But, but Reef, Reef, if you're in them cla- you know, if you're a principal and you're in them classrooms every day, you don't need to do that because you already know what's happening. That's a big if. if. That's a big yeah, if, right? But we if. know there are a whole well, lot I, of folks saying, that ain't seeing Right. <laughs> I'm All saying it to, to folks that are that are school leaders. Here's well, I think even that's do. different, though. That's different, like, you know, being following a kid all day and seeing what their seven hours and four minutes looks and feels like from yeah. their perspective is still different than coming to observe and being a presence. You know, I'm, I'm talking about like literally sitting in a student seat. What does that what does that seat feel like? What does the room feel like? What does oh can I go to the bathroom feel like? What does the lunch feel like? Like all of that over a course of a day, not just being a presence in the classrooms, you know. Yeah, but if you that's not what I'm talking about, Rick. I'm not talking about going in and doing observation. I'm talking about dedicating your day to being in all of them classrooms or whatever. Mm-hmm. And then so therefore you can get multiple, multiple perspectives and multiple outlooks in terms of like how you, all your kids are learning, not just one particular kid that you're following. And so you as as principals, y'all need to be in these classrooms. Y'all don't need to be behind desks answering emails, doing TikTok and all the other dumb shit y'all doing. Y'all need to be in these classrooms giving feedback to teachers and giving feedback to, to students. 
Well, I just want to now, say yesterday on that you said point, you were going to do a TikTok with yeah. the handshake and the dance in the oh, auditorium. Whatever. Now do you're fronting in front of everybody. Don't do that. Don't front in front of America. Every, do you know, for you to be a devout Muslim, <laughs> you do lie a lot. <laughs> uh, well, listen, because we are coming to the to the close All of right. the show. Uh, uh, I want to wrap it up. Uh, I want to give uh, the last word to Harrison, to our guest today. Uh, I, what I also would like to do as we do this, I would like to show, you know, for this show, we're talking about fathers. I'm glad that we were able to see that educationists are the actual problem. They don't care about your kids or your kids <laughs> night. They don't care about your job that you have to take your kids, you know, whatever. They don't care about your kids night. Nothing like that. They want to ruin your life. They want to rain on your parade. They think your kids should just be like, like in South Korea where they go to school for 24 hours a day and then like you know, burn out by 23. Um, anyways, what I would say to Ray and to Sharif, if you could wrap up in your final comments, this is what I would ask you. If I'm a dad who does want to do a good job, but I don't feel like I know all of this stuff that we're talking about, I'm listening to a lot of this and a lot of it's flying over my head. I hear acronyms. I hear kind of inside baseball and school stuff. What would you just tell me as a lay person? Like, what's the best I could do? Like, tell me some some actual small strategies, small things I could do to be good. I, that's all I want to do. I just want to be good at this. And I have people breathing down my neck who don't expect me to be good. They don't, they don't think I can do this and they're doubting me. What would your advice be to me uh, as a parent? Start with you, Sharif. What do you think? Yeah. I mean, to me, I would say, you know, one, make the presence felt, um, you know, and I think sometimes it's not always about like the answers it's the, or the right questions. So really decide what questions am I going to constantly ask, you know, um, not only of the the school um, about like, you know, and, and uh, Ray hinted at some of this, but, you know, how, you know, asking how do you support kids who are struggling? How do you help them um, when they need help? How do you see them? What do you do when you're frustrated? Like I would ask educators those type of questions but i'll also make sure i'm asking my child like the the right questions i don't need to have all the answers for their homework and so to speak but i should ask like what their experience is where do they feel challenged which teacher challenges them the most and supports them where do they feel the most marginalized like i would be asking those type of questions because the, the one thing that a child wants to see is that there's someone who has their back it doesn't mean that they're always going to agree with them it doesn't mean that they're always going to you know uh you know, like just move barriers out of the way, but they want to know that the person is there. So as those fathers who are, you know, maybe in, in spaces that are like just more challenging, I, I would say like one, you belong. Don't ever feel like even if it's 99% uh, white women in your building, you belong because your child is, is there. But I, I do think arming yourself with the questions um, and maybe that's something that we can also, you know, uh, collaborate on, um, fellas, about, you know, like an op-ed or something, but just sharing, again, resources around, like, what they can do um, as fathers. Um, and, again, I would, I would love, you know, like, Swans and Pastor Jones and those, like, I will ask them, like, what are the, some of the things that they saw that kept them coming back? Um, and, you know, just finding other additional ways to, to codify it. But uh, you know, I, I think the main thing is making sure mm -hmm. that that you are a an absolute presence, um, you know, nonstop in the in the academia. Even if it's even if you had a bad experience as your own self as a student, whatever. Like, you don't have to. Let's try not to replicate your bad experience by just releasing your your child into the to, to the abyss because everybody ain't gonna. You know, there there are a lot of kids, black kids, who still talk about their experiences. Um, even in the most Tony privileged, high end, whatever, however you define that, you know, um, schools. And you, we saw this like right before and after the pandemic, where it was like black in, right? Black in mm -hmm. these mm -hmm. super wealthy, privileged schools. They were saying, this is my black experience in those schools. Mm -hmm. and, Social and so media we have to recognize. Campaigns. Yeah. Yeah. For people listening, there were social media campaigns for several high end schools where kids made accounts that basically said being black in Dalton, for instance, you know, $50,000 a year school. And those threads, those, uh, they showed a lot of like trauma that was being recreated. It was hearing, right? Like reading that. And these are like kids. Like, I mean, it was like gut wrenching. Yeah. All right, Raymond, sir, 
uh, what would you tell a father who just wants to be good, just wants yeah. to do the right thing? First and foremost, uh, <laughs> if, 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 you, if your kid goes to a school that puts an extra emphasis on play, run. <laughs> because, because as black people, man, we don't have time to be playing in these schools. Uh, I remember my grandmother, uh, who, who didn't have a high school diploma, but uh, she made sure that uh, I knew that going to school, I was going to school to learn. She never said, hey, you're going to school to play. She said, you're going to school to learn. And so putting that focus on learning, I think is extremely important. The second thing is uh, building community, right? So like, I'm sure that you're not, hopefully you're not the black, the, first, the only black parent there. And so building community with people that look like you so that, you know, no question is a dumb question and you can ask questions to the folks that are in the community. Um, and I think, uh, you know, it's tough being a black man in 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 in, uh, in in uh in education, right? It's tough being a black man in education. So it's going to be even harder to be a black black male parent in education because a lot of the stuff that happens, and I know we talked about it a little bit, but you know I don't want it to be so taboo to where we can't talk about it. But like a lot of it is is feminized, right? And so and so finding ways to navigate the space. Uh, is extremely difficult. So it's important for school leaders like me, school leaders like Reef, when he gets back in the helm, um, to to make sure that we're creating communities to where folks can come out and they can unpack their thoughts. Um, they can unlive the traumas that are associated with education that they receive, right? So that we can um, heal as a community uh, and so that we can uh, be better beacons and stewards for our kids to learn as Black men. All right. Before we get to Harrison, because we're going to give you the last word, sir, you know, I will just jump in and say, um, do not run from schools if they allow your children to play, because play is a good thing uh, for children and for childhood. And it play also is a, play is a, so play, let, 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 I'm going to give you an example. OK, give me an example. Okay. It's going to be a bad one, but give me your example. Fine. <laughs> no, I got I, listen, I got to clarify what grade you're talking about, Ray. All right. So cool. I'm going to yeah. do this. You, right. So I have. So I have kindergartens, right? I got some kindergartens that come from affluent backgrounds, right? That are reading Harry Potter books and can tell you everything that's in that book. I got some folks that are coming to kindergarten that can't even identify letters. So it's a huge range in terms of like where you're coming in. And a lot of that is based off of affluence, right? And so there are some times when, you know, you have a kid that may not, that may come from a free and reduced background, but that, their parent is on their ass letting them know that, hey, listen, this is what you need to do because I don't want you to be in the same position as me. And so therefore they're coming in, they're reading Harry Potter books too because their parents are, are, are doing the things that they do. They're creating agentic moments, shout out to Charles, uh, in order for their parents to be who they need to be, right? I mean, uh, for their kids to be who they need to be. But in most instances, I don't see, and I see a, 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 a when by the time they get to third grade, you got you got kids that are still trying to fill gaps why you got the other kids that came in reading Harry Potter books that are just way more advanced. And then by the time they get to 12th grade, these are, these are all the kids that are in the same competition to go to the best colleges. No so, um, so first of all, let me say Harry Potter is boring. Uh, <laughs> they're, they're very long, verbose English <laughs> books that nobody should read. Uh, so I don't care. I don't care who's reading them Wr <laughs> written by a, written by a transphobe. Um, listen, my Ray, older Ray kids loves actually, Harry Potter because he, he always does. brings that he up as up the all example. The time, he's like, and I'm just like, they read Harry Potter. Like, now, if you said they're all too, reading was, Iceberg I, I, Slim, I'd be like, okay, all right. Judy Blume, um, <laughs> you know. Well, listen, uh, my, my oldest kids read those big, thick, ugly books uh, of Harry Potter, and we still have them in the house. And the younger ones won't touch them because times have changed. I think even in the attention span of kids, things have changed over time. This is what I will say. And and they're boring. So I just, you know, I just gonna put that out there. Like I I tried, I tried to pick them up to model it <laughs> for the younger ones. <laughs> and I got through like four pages of them yeah. jokers. And I was like, this is boring. You were sitting this in there frightened, like, was, let me let me yeah, model let me, with this Harry Potter book. Let me model <laughs> you this. For stop you. It. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, I started reading them and I was like, muggles and mugglers and see, but you were you going know, against the research, what? Chris Stewart. The research says model reading what you enjoy reading, not reading something that 
that you know you ain't gonna like you gonna put out it in 15 minutes you know what i'm saying like <laughs> i feel like parents need to hear this like i wasn't a failure for looking at it and going oh man this is boring i wouldn't read this either you know but this is what I, <laughs> i've never read a harry yeah. potter book so it's terrible I, uh this is what i say to parents i don't have any uh uh like wisdom that comes outside of my like what i knew as a parent but as the parent of multiples, what I would say is listen to your kid very intently. Um, listen for their frustration. Listen for the things that that they're happy about, whatever, when you ask them about school. The whole thing about how is your school fine, just nothing, well, you know, whatever, and you don't follow up and you don't get any more information is going to make it so I think at some point you're going to have a surprise. Like you're going to have like a, a big problem at some point that you didn't see coming and it's because you weren't hearing all the, the the things you needed to hear. So listen intently, have an ongoing dog, dialogue that never stops um, and make that dialogue, you know, one where you get all the information you need. You don't have to be an expert. You do have to be an investigator. So when you hear things, investigate them um, and be militant about uh, when you do have to be involved. Like with the school, you do have to be somewhat militant because educationists will tell you things at times, that is more about the way they want to order their work rather than what your child actually needs. I have different types of children. Some of them are in the math side of things and the science side of things. Some of them are in the art side of things and the performance side of things, whatever. And that has taught me that one plan isn't going to work for everybody. Like one thing is not going to work for every kid. Some kids need play as a way to access the information. Right. Like some kids need some kinetic energy to be blown off. They need to like like get moving on some things and sitting in a classroom isn't always going to be working for them. I'm not going to do the learning style thing because apparently I've been told there's no such thing as learning styles. That was a myth. Whatever. Um, you know, I don't know that it was a myth. But anyways, listen to your kids uh, and be militant when you have to and get in get involved when you have to. You don't have to know everything. But you do have to ask a lot of questions. Harrison Peters, sir, you get the final word on this, on the best advice that we could give for, for uh, fathers that don't th feel like they know everything, but feel like they do want to do a good job. Like there's a need in them to do a good job. I'm thinking about uh, Ta-Nehisi Coates. Uh, and when you say fathers who don't know everything, but definitely, you know, Ta-Nehisi said it, it's not necessary that you believe that the officer who choked Eric Gardner set out that day to destroy a body. All you need to understand is that the officer carries with him the power of the American state and the weight of an American legacy. And they necessitate that of the bodies destroyed every year, some wild and disproportionate number of them will be black. So my thing is, when I look at the current education construct and what it is to our children, it's everything that you said. Be present. Be militant. Push. Ask questions. But I always say step back and just say, make sure you're being a father. And if you're being a strong father in whatever sense that we've defined it uh, this evening, you can't go wrong. And then be a father to another young man or another young lady as well in your ecosystem. I love it. There's so many different ways to do well at this. There are different, you know, when it comes to men and it comes to fathers, uh, fatherhood, we talked about this at the beginning of the show, feels like a destination, but fathering is a verb and it's something that we all have a capacity to do. We could all be uh, leaning in a little bit. And if you got some surplus fathering in you, hey, maybe your kids got affluenza and your kids are like, your kids are good or whatnot. Maybe you got some surplus fathering uh, to be able to lend to others and maybe that would just be what being a good man is about. Maybe that would just be like what being a good citizen would be about. Definitely what a, being a good black man would be about. I know that there are many black men in my life uh, coming up where uh, the amount of fathering that was going on across different lanes. I had a Franken father when you put them all together. They had all very different skills. They came in my life in different points. It was like putting together a Franken father. And um, um, I think we need more of that. For kids because not everybody's going to know everything appreciate you harrison for jo for joining the show today much appreciated how can people find you let people know how they can find you yeah at harrison peters the twitter or hit me up on mcell leaders at gmail.com and i would definitely encourage people y'all just, just had a conference right can we 
Can we find out about your conference? Yeah. Yeah, please share about, I was just about to say, please share about, because uh, that was also super dope, impactful, important, needed, all, all the things. Um, Let's hear it. Yeah, our work centers on leadership. We believe, A, that teachers make the magic happen, but we also believe that leaders create those conditions for the magic to happen. We also know that there is new research that's out there that talks about the impact that leaders have on learning. And for the first time in a, uh, in decades, um, the leader of the building has almost the same level of impact on learning as teachers do. So that's why we believe critical and we believe in leaders of color because we also know that in order to um, figure out and solve for uh, this huge gap in teachers of color, we need leaders of color because I'll drive all the way across town to work for a leader that cares about me, that believes in me, but I wouldn't walk out my front door and walk across the street to a school where the leader doesn't empower me. So we believe leaders matter. So that's the work of MCEL. Check us out on MCELleaders.org and I would love to connect with anybody that's interested in just being in the club. All right, y'all. Y'all got your marching orders. Every time I hear about a group like this, an organization like this, you know that I say the same thing. Sharif knows this, so he probably knows what's about to come. We have got to stop uh, spending money on coffee and different things and not supporting organizations like this that do good work. I love to hear about great things that people do and good work, but I even like it more when people right afterwards go and hit a donate button or go and find yeah. some way to say like, you know what, for this month, I got $30 for you. I got $10 for you. I got 15, I got 850, I got $7, I got $3, I got a dollar on it. I got five on it, whatever you got, man. We just, 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 this is what I need people to start doing. Everybody can be a philanthropist. Just get that through your head. Everybody can fund the revolution. You hear about great work like this. The one thing that we always need is resources. So every time I hear about you know, good people doing good work. Now, see, now I didn't put myself on the hook. Now I got to go give him sell some money. But this is, <laughs> and call me out next week if I haven't done it. But this is what I want y'all to do. If you got five on it, you got 10 on it, you got 50 on it, whatever, whenever you hear this good work, find it uh, and donate. Do something good for these Appreciate y'all, brothers, man. Y'all doing amazing work, man. Appreciate y'all. Uh, and fam, thank y'all for listening. Listen, send us an email. This is what I want you to do. Uh, first of all, if you like the show, share it with others. We're trying to make sure that we keep getting the word out. Number two, um, what I need y'all to do is uh, leave, leave, uh, uh, leave a review, a good review of the show so that others can know what they're going to listen to and what you like about it. The last thing I will say is email us with show ideas, with critique, with you know whatever you want to say. Listen, hey, go off though. Just, just, just send us an email. Here's the email address. It's info at 8 bh org and eight is the letter eight uh and bh is for black hands so it's just eight bh it's just three digits dot org uh info send us uh email and let us know how you feel about the show and anything we said tonight that you find objectionable or whatnot let's argue anyways we appreciate y'all this has been another episode of the eight black hands episode 191 we'll see you next week for the last show of the year which would be episode 191